speak on more than one item. And um, we will get started with that. I'm Councilmember Weezer. We've been joined by Councilmember Harris Dawson. We will call, uh, we'll take up the multiple item speaker cards. First is Herman 666HHH. Herman, uh, before you get started at the last plum meeting, uh, either you or uh, Mr. Encino signed up using aliases and other names that will vulgar. Uh, if you sign number under other aliases and, um, and continue to do that and commit fraud in signing up, we will ask you not to come back to these meetings. Thank you. I'll tell you it's fraud. Go to CD4 and let's talk about 4500 North Woodman Avenue regarding David Rue. What did David Rue do that's fraud versus what I do on a public comment card subjecting me to criticism? It's only a part of the Brown Act. Besides, there was no community impact statement submitted on item 180153. In addition to that, we have item number eight. That talking about level parking of 33 bicycle parking spaces. Not that anyone particular fucking cares because a bicycle is not enough space for a home for the homeless. As brought to you by Eric Garcetti during the Department of Public Social Service conference regarding the Civic Center at 813 East 4th Place, Los Angeles, California, 90013. Participant helpline, well, I asked for help because I, too, am looking for city's affordable housing after you yourself, Mr. Chair, and your honorable rookie city attorneys permitted me to be homeless. And now we're asking to comply with Measure JJJ. Well, let's comply with HHH, which you all know means bitch, bitch, bitch. Because there's no permit for complying with any measure of housing. Because we have a shortage. And the gross issue here is whether or not Americans have a right to housing first over illegal immigrants. And I, being an American citizen, native to America is finding out it's a motherfucking bitch, bitch, bitch under JJJ to find city affordable housing stock. Now my general public comment. Unfortunately, as of today, David Rue plans to resign due to his penal code 1192.7, a serious crime. When you fuck with children, you should be reminded that Mr. Mr. Herman, hold this time. Hold this time. Hold this time, sir. This is the planning and land use well, management. I'm, let me finish. Let me finish. I, I'll, I'll hear you out. Let me finish. This is the planning, land use, and management committee. Public comment in this committee has to do with anything related to planning and land use issues with respect to the city. So, if you just give general public comment that is not allowed here, you could go to a full city council to do that. Thank you. So, because David Rue is a councilman and he impairs my ability to live in affordable housing because I'm homeless by design through gentrification and that of the fucked up city attorney Mike Fears office some time ago. You should pull up my records and see if I have a case similar to David Rue because I sure hell know I do not. I could never sleep with a child. I can never seduce a woman for for pay to play and give her a nice position in a job like you did with Francine Godoy, Jose Weizar. So don't tell me I'm a fucking This is not subject. in the domain It has of the to do with housing, and the yeah. bitch was looking for more Planning money and land to use get housing, committee. and that's exactly what happened, your, Mr. Dawson. Your time is up, Mr. Thank you. And um, we have other public comment speakers as well. They will picked up uh, oh Patricia McAllister we could ask you to come up to speak on your multiple item cards please thank you um, I'm concerned here I see issues here where you don't have affordable housing units but you're allowing them to build these housing units 
Now, one of them, you want to take the money. It's number, um, number 10, nothing about affordable housing. You're going to build 173 residential units, and you're not requiring that they have any affordable units. Number eight, uh, you're going to have 21 dwelling units, and instead of them paying, uh, having affordable units, you're telling them to pay money to the, um, uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And you know throughout the year that money goes into the uh, city attorney's pocket and your pockets, you know, for all kinds of things. So we want you to build affordable units. Don't just let these people start building. Now, this is a responsibility of this, this committee right here. I'm not satisfied with this committee. Where's the clock? Am I on the clock? Oh, okay. So also, number six, no affordable units. Now, this is on Skid Row. You're going from 9th to 6th Skid Row to 11th Skid Row. This is Skid Row number 6, not one affordable unit. You're letting them build 945 residential dwellings, 210 hotel rooms, all kinds of stuff, commercial, and not one affordable unit. Now, this committee is responsible for that. Every unit that you build, you've got to have affordable housing. And I don't like the idea that you let these people who get the affordable housing get bought out by these these uh, realtors a couple of years later. I know that happens. They'll offer them a couple thousand dollars to leave and then they'll rent it at market price. So I need you guys to do that. We, we need reports from you. I want reports from you, okay? Every, because I follow the budget and everything. You, I see money being misappropriated, not spent. Who, Weezy, you have a hundred million to spend on Skid Row and you haven't did a, I went over, I drove over there using my ways. Took pictures. You haven't done a darn thing on Skid Row. I want you guys out of office. Thank you. Um, we've been joined by Councilmember Price, and now we will uh, go to the continue the agenda. Item number two. We have one public speaker. We'll take that off the agenda. Of the consent calendar, I mean. Item number five, we have no public speakers. We'll take item five on consent without objection. Item number six, we will continue to May 22nd. Item six, continue to May 22nd. <coughs> Item seven, we will approve on consent. No objections in item seven to approve on consent. Item number eight, we have one public speaker we will hold. Okay. Item number eight, we have um, one public speaker we will hold that. Mm -hmm. Item number nine, we will approve on consent. No objections to approve item nine on consent. Oh. Item number 10, no public speakers. We will approve item number 10 on consent. Item number 11 will be continued to June the 5th. And going back to item number two, Doug Moore, do you withdraw your speaking card? Yes. You do? Okay. Thank you. So Doug Moore, uh, withdraw the speaking card for item two. We will take that on consent. Councilman, item just on consent. one clarification on item two. Uh, on the blurb on the, on the agenda today, it denotes that the land use ordinances are needed for the construction of the stadium. The stadium has been constructed. So just to clarify that the intent of the motion and the text is as it relates to the sign district and the sign district ordinance. So we just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Can we approve that item with and incorporate your comments on that as a clarification? How was the opening, Mr. Price? It was great. Yeah. Great. Excellent. One, one zero, right? Turn it on. Turn it on. Turn it on. Yeah. I said it was a festive occasion. <laughs> Family and friends were there for the uh, opening game, uh, and we were victorious. It was a uh, exciting victory at the end, but a victory nonetheless. <laughs> okay. All right. 
And uh, item number eight, who is the speaker for eight? Tom, uh, you withdraw your speaking card? Okay, so withdraw a speaking card from eight for the record, and that will be put on consent as well, approved without objection. So to summarize, item two, consent, item five, consent, six is continued to the 22nd of this month, item seven, consent, item eight, consent, item nine, consent, 10, consent, and 11 has been continued to the fifth. Thank you. Mr. Herman, uh, please do not make animal noises as we're conducting the meeting that disrupts us from, from doing our meeting. Uh, that's your first warning, okay? Thank you, sir. Action items are item number one, report from the Director of Planning, Vince Bertoni. You do not look like Vince Bertoni. <laughs> I do not. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Kevin Keller, Executive Officer, City Planning. Uh, sitting in for Vince Bertoni today. Uh, just a quick update today about design review boards. Um, the city has 13 design review boards across the city. Um, staff have been working with many of the council offices to update these board rosters, fill vacancies, and improve the, uh, the case review and design process these critical boards play to reviewing community-friendly design in, in all of our special neighborhoods across the city. Just wanted to make an announcement that we're going to be holding actual um, trainings for our design review board members. May 11th at Van Nuys City Hall for our Valley Design Review Boards, and May 18th at City Hall East for our Metro Area Design Review Boards. We're gonna be focusing on the authorities of Design Review Boards, the duties, uh, the findings, and how to run a more efficient meeting um, as these Design Review Boards meet in the evening in the community. So we look forward to improving the process and really wanna thank our Design Review Board members and the Office of the City Attorney to helping us with this training. That concludes my report, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Uh, we have one public speaker, Noel Weiss. Mr. Weiss, you have one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weiss. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to the committee. Uh, this is on, again, item one, the uh, LA City Planning Report. Um, I wanted to thank planning for the letter directed to Mr. O'Farrell in connection with the 5448 West Franklin project. Uh, this letter dated February 23rd to Mr. O'Farrell said that uh, during the public hearing for the project before the CPC, tenants currently residing voiced concerns about the uninhabitable conditions of the property and their inability to have the landlord address these problems. Mr. O'Farrell never responded formally to that letter. This is part of the need in these tenants. Uh, I represent six of them. Um, are basically not paid the relocation money. They were never Ellist. Uh, and part, I think, in terms of going forward for the planning department, I don't know whether we need a requirement, a specific requirement, that the tenant relocation package be presented as part of the land entitlement application, or where there's tenants involved, my request respectfully to planning as well as to the commission and the council is that we get a relocation package as part of the condition to make sure that these tenants are taken care of so that the unscrupulous of, among the city um, don't take advantage of the tenants. And I know that this committee is concerned about that, and I appreciate your opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. And yes, that uh, issue comes up on various projects, and we need to find a better streamlined way of, of fixing that rather than us chasing the problem afterwards. Thank you very much. Yeah. Item number three, um, if you, that could be read into the record, please. Sure. Uh, oh, so on item one, we will receive and file. And item three, we could read that into the record, please. Um, item three, Councilman, this is a CAO report relative to a request by Councilwoman Martinez to expedite building permits and the granting of fee waivers for uh, buildings and homes damaged by the Latunia Canyon and Creek wildfires. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Uh, my name is Nick Campbell from the CAO's office. Uh, the item before you is a report from our office relaying information received from the Departments of Building and Safety, Planning, and the Fire Department um, relative to uh, the motion um, from uh, Councilmember uh, Martinez. Uh, this is related to the expediting of building permits and granting of fee waivers associated with the Latuna Canyon and Creek wildfires. Um, the Department of Building and Safety reports uh, the residents affected by the wildfires will need to submit plans to and obtain permits from Building and Safety um, for the reconstruction or repair of their properties. Uh, to assist customers affected by the wildfires, the Building and Safety has already created a 
uh, hotline and a phone number that they can call um, where they will have answer, their questions answered regarding the permitting process. In addition, they can uh, go to the Development Services Centers and utilize uh, Building and Safety's concierge services. Um, and this is at the Metro and Van Nuys Development Services Centers um, for information on Building and Safety Services as well as um, guidance through the uh, permitting process. Uh, the Department of uh, City Planning reports that it will have a it expects a limited role in providing the necessary approvals and uh, clearances for the rebuilding of structures damaged by the wildfires. Um, the southern burn area from uh, the Latunia Canyon and Creek wildfires overlaps portions of a specific plan. Um, however, residential structures in these areas um, that are being reconstructed due to fire damage would not be uh, subject to the same standards and as new construction. Um, and such permits that are directed to planning would uh, be given priority review and the review process would take place the same day that a applicant brings them into a uh, uh, public counter at one of the city's development service centers. Um, additionally, planning states that it could not waive its fees um, uh, as uh, unless planning was reimbursed by the city for the cost of providing services. Um, and then for fire, uh, they their role is really limited to the hydrant and access review um, for building, buildings damaged by the fire. Um, the, fee, the fee for this review is $216, um, and the fire department re reports that this fee could be waived through council action, um, and that based on a preliminary damage assessment um, from the fire, it estimates that the maximum fee waiver would be about $28,296. Um, it should be noted that such a fee waiver, fee waiver would have an impact on the uh, fire, fire department's budget. Um, and sorry, I did actually uh, miss one point. Um, building and safety has stated that they cannot waive fees due to state law and prior opinions received from the city attorney's office. Um, available for any questions that you have on the CAO report. And we also have representatives from the departments. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? No. Well, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez for introducing this motion. Uh, to find ways to assist those that were affected by the uh, Latuna Canyon and Creek Well fires. I think this is good to uh, have the public understand what uh, we're doing to help them uh, to rebuild. So thank you. Thank you. We will, uh, seeing there's no questions, we'll move to receive and file this item. Any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Item number four. Item four, Councilman, this is a report from the planning department. It's uh, in response to a request as it relates to an update uh, re regarding freeway adjacent developments and, uh, and their impacts. Great, thank you. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Shauna Bonson, Principal City Planner. I'm just gonna do a couple introductory remarks and then hand it over to my colleague, uh, Claire Bowen. So foremost, this is a status update and report on a council motion 170309. Um, the CLA was actually identified as the lead department with assistance by Department of City Planning, DOT, and the city attorney. So as for the DCP role, uh, we have widely coordinated internally with both our policy and project planning divisions. Just wanted to acknowledge the great number of staff that have been um, incorporated as we um, also met with, uh, you know, to determine immediate and long-term solutions. We met with air quality experts and other departments as well to bring forward some ideas. Um, before you today, so myself as a Chief Sustainability Officer and Claire Bowen as the lead for the Urban Design Studio, it kind of finally landed on an approach to really address uh, design and other com components that could give really concrete direction. But I wanted to acknowledge that um, as we approach the task, really asking what more could planning do. We were a bit surprised to find that um, the air quality cha challenges require such broad based kind of cross agency approaches that you'll hear from Claire today, kind of walking you through the process of what we discovered. So rather than a kind of off the shelf few solution ideas, it's actually much more comprehensive, uh, the, the solutions. So uh, with that, Claire will walk you through what we found and what the next steps might be. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Claire Bowen, Senior City Planner with the Department of City Planning, it's Urban Design Studio. I am pleased to provide you this afternoon with an overview of the report that our department submitted on the topic of air quality adjacent to freeways. This topic has also been of much concern to our City Planning Commission, and we provided them with a similar update this past Thursday. As Shauna said, this topic is very complex. 
this issue was actually highlighted in the LA Times this morning, and they identified that there are impro the improvements to air quality in the Southern California region, while they've been improving over the last number of years, the rate of those improvements is starting to slow down. There are many factors that contribute to our poor air quality. Some are well known, such as vehicles, diesel trucks, power plants, while others are less obvious sources, such as industrial boilers, residential heaters, and construction equipment. And while stricter regulations have had a positive impact, as evidenced by steady decline in emission levels, global warming, which is contributing to a greater number of warm air days, may be behind some of the stalled progress that is now being measured. The article highlights that the number of days in which the region violated federal health standards for ozone increased to 145 days last year, compared to only 132 days in 2016 and 113 days in 2015. To put it simply, these pollutant sources, they're heavier than air, such that normally they fall more rapidly to the ground. That explains why in the colder winter months, our air quality is typically cleaner than during the warmer summer months. During these warmer days, these particles are kept aloft for longer periods of time, and therefore both contributing to poorer air quality, but also expanding the overall area affected by these particles. As defined by a 2010 report released by the Center for Disease Control, there are two primary, primary prevention strategies. The first is, fo is focused on reducing mobile source emissions, and the second is focusing on reducing exposure to mobile source emissions. The solutions to these two strategies are very different, and due to the many, many challenges that I will highlight shortly of developing site-specific mitigations, the Center for Disease Control emphasizes the value of focusing on reducing mobile source emission levels in the first place. And again, that speaks to kind of the variety of things that provide, pr produce those emissions in the first place. The Center for Disease Control exerts that many of the strategies that Los Angeles and the region are already focused on are exactly the right kind of approach. For example, our efforts to expand the transportation system and increase access to transit, walking, bicycling, and rideshare programs are the kinds of efforts that the center states are shown to reduce vehicle use and thus reduce mobile source emissions. California's leadership on strengthening tailpipe emission reduction standards has also played a key role in reducing mobile source emissions. And efforts to retrofit the city's own fleet of trucks to low emission vehicles, as well as the port of Los Angeles' efforts to incentivize the retrofitting of diesel trucks, leaving the port are steps in the right direction. The move towards a more robust network of electrical vehicle charging stations is further encouraging car owners to purchase electrical vehicles that produce far less mobile source emissions. The results of these efforts are visible when we look at the skyline on a summer day and can actually see downtown or the mountains. When I moved here 30 years ago, you could not. But as I mentioned earlier, that positive trend may now be reversing as the number of warm days increases. We still have work to do. Building more housing near transit, building out the Measure M projects, expanding the electrical vehicle charging station network, clustering housing, jobs, education, and community serving uses, and encouraging more walking and biking, bikes, bicycling. And certainly, if we back off of current clean air quality goals and regulations, we can expect that air quality will worsen further, and there will be much greater impacts and costs associated with personal health in the region. So let's get back to the Center for Disease Control's second strategy, which focuses on reducing a person's exposure to the mobile source emissions. I wish that there was a simple fix here, but there is not. The reason is that the gases and particles that vehicles and other sources emit behave in different ways due to their various chemical compositions. Some linger in the air longer than others. They come in various shapes and sizes. They are responsive to shifts in wind, ambient air temperatures, and sunlight. This means it is difficult to predict exactly where on a particular day the particles are causing the most harm. Particles and gases also penetrate through building walls. To address these challenges, the Center for Disease Control focuses on a couple of solutions. These include improving ventilation systems, a adding roadside barriers, and looking at land use policies that limit new development close to heavily trafficked roads and freeways. On the first solution, the City Council has already demonstrated leadership on this topic with the adoption of the Clean Up Green Up standards in 2016. The Kugu Ordinance, as it is called, mandates the installation and regular maintenance of high efficiency air intake filters in new freeway adjacent residential buildings with mechanical air systems. The second solution is a tough one, tough one to legislate, as the effectiveness of roadside barriers, either walls, trees, or both, is still not completely known. 
As I mentioned earlier, the particles all behave differently and are susceptible to changes in weather, so determining exactly where the barrier should go and at what height and for how long the distance is very difficult. Some studies have expressed concern that the wall could actually exacerbate the problem by pushing a concentration of the particles along the wall and then push it out into that nearest opening. Two, buildings above or below the wall would not have the same level of protections. Trees and other landscaping materials are often suggested as a potential solution, and certainly landscaping elements provide many, many environmental benefits, but the extent to which they might actually mitigate the health impacts in a particular location um, is not known. And thirdly, perhaps the most challenging solution and decision makers will, that decision makers will continue to be faced with is the challenge of weighing the pros and cons of building new housing near a transit station that also happens to be near a freeway. One option when there is sufficient land may be to set the building back from the freeway, but this will not always be feasible. And we know that on warmer days, again, the negative effects may actually be felt further from the freeway, so compar compared to immediately adjacent to it. As I promised, this is not an easy topic. There is no simple short-term solution. It is complex. But let's keep working locally, regionally, and with our state leaders to establish stricter tailpipe emission standards and tighten regulations on other pollutant sources. Let's build out the projects of Measure M and make our streets safer for bicycling, walking, and all the other new electronic scooters so that our children and their children have cleaner air to breathe. Thank you. We're here to take any questions. Thank you. We'll go to uh, public comment first and then return to uh, discussion. <coughs> first is uh, Christopher Chavez then Adrian Martinez and Gina Goodhill. Greetings, council members. My name is Chris Chavez. I'm the deputy policy director for the Coalition for Clean Air. I'm here to speak, to speak in support of item number four relative to freeway air pollution and housing. However, the Coalition for Clean Air urges for a stronger policy that protects the health of residents while addressing LA's dire housing needs. This includes creating actual goals and benchmarks for the city to meet, as well as uh, investing in electric vehicle charging infrastructure and other emission reduction strategies. I also encourage the council to consider the value of community air monitoring uh, programs as part of this policy. The Coalition for Clean Air operates a sensor, uh, air sensor network mostly focused on the South Bay areas around the refineries and the Alameda corridor. While these are not EPA reference sensors, they can still be of help to inform the community of their air quality needs. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Huizar and members of the committee. My name is Adrian Martinez and I'm here on behalf of Earth Justice. We're here to support um, efforts to address the near highway pollution issue. We think it's a critical issue that impacts um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the city. Uh, we do suggest exploring additional uh, ways to curtail pollution. We think it's good to push our developers to include more charging. Charging is a critical element for people to choose uh, zero emission vehicles. And we say that for passenger vehicles, but in addition, we should explore efforts to get zero emission medium and heavy duty uh, vehicles like trucks and delivery trucks in our urban cores. These are, uh, you know, strategies that can provide real benefits uh, to communities that are adjacent to heavy traffic roadways. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Gina Goodhill, Reflo, Mike Ogara. Hi. Welcome. Thanks so much for taking public comments. My name is Gina Goodhill with Tesla. We are a sustainable energy company working to transition the world's future towards clean energy. And one of the ways that we're most well known for doing that is through electric vehicles. Um, we support the, the commissions and the committee's effort to increase EV readiness and to look at clean air um, and ways to increase clean air through electric vehicles. One of the best ways that the city can do that is through investing in EV infrastructure. Um, the first question that people want to know when they look to buy an electric vehicle is where am I going to charge my car? And if the city can work towards increasing the amount of charging that people have access to, it will make that decision easier and make the transition from an internal gas combustion engine to an electric vehicle that much less scary. So we support this effort and any increased efforts to increase EV readiness. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Mike Ogara, Gary Agus, and Doug Haynes. 
Hi, my name is Michael Guerra. I've been a community activist in Sun Valley for 13 years. Uh, we put some uh, uh, items out there on your desk. The highlighted portions are important. This is an article that was written in the LA Times some time ago. Uh, you've all read over and over again of the harmful effects of diesel truck and auto emissions, especially the effects on sensitive receptors. Please stop residential development within a thousand feet of freeways now. You can still put commercial enterprises next to the freeway as people don't normally spend more than eight or ten hours a day there. Many residents spend all day in or around their home and wind up with respiratory ailments. And the AQMAD doesn't even measure the smallest and ha most harmful of particle matter, which is PM1. And uh, there's something in that article I gave you about diesel death zones. Please read it. My associate's going to speak to you about that article that was in the LA Times, which you have copies of, and that's highlighted in yellow. And Claire Bowen is going to talk this thing to death. Do something now. Nobody's doing anything except talking about it for years. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Agus. I'm with the Sun Valley Neighborhood Council, but I'm speaking for myself this afternoon. Uh, as my colleague Michael Gary just stated, uh, we have a couple of articles there for you uh, to, to look at, uh, one of which was, was almost quoted by, by uh, uh, Claire. Uh, it's from the, uh, from the LA Times, the California section. We are losing the fight against smog and ozone. Ozone levels in England areas went, went up last summer. Researchers show that diesel trucks driving in real world conditions spew more pollution than under laboratory emissions. The minimum distance from freight corridors, including freeways, should be a minimum of 1,000 feet. There's much evidence to show that the pollution even travels further for residential properties. Not so bad for the commercial properties when you're only spending eight hours a day, but if you're living there, uh, it, it's got to be more than that. Uh, one comment on uh, electric, also in the article, on electric cars. Uh, their tires and their brakes also cause uh, harmful pollution. So that's not going to solve our problem with electric cars. Uh, please make that minimum 1,000 feet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Doug Haynes, Michelle Kidman, Jorge Madrid. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Haynes. I'm with East Hollywood Neighborhood Council. I spoke to this committee before in this matter and also last week to the City Planning Commission. I'll just remind you what I said earlier. Living within 500 feet of a freeway results in double the rate of autism, double the rate of dementia, double the rate of cardiovascular disease, and a lifelong reduction in lung capacity for children ages 10 through 12, 13 when the lungs experience their most growth. In East Hollywood, children live next to freeways. They are forced to attend schools for their entire K through 12 education next to freeways, and the only parks are next to freeways. And I've included photos for you. I hope you'll look at them while I'm here, please, Councilman Wiesar and the rest of you. This is our pocket park. It's been taken over by MS-13, where they smoke meth all day. This area is what I call the Triangle of Death, a 101 freeway on one side, Santa Monica Boulevard, Route 66 on the other side, Western Avenue on the other side. All day long, the children within this area experience the health risks that we're talking about today, in addition to the on-ramps and off-ramps. The clock isn't even running. I, can I have just a few seconds to finish, please? Um, my neighborhood already includes some of the most densely populated census tracts in the United States. The zoning is R4 and R5 to encourage further residential development in these zones while knowing the health risk is morally bankrupt for a city. I hope you'll start doing something effective to help the people in my community and your community as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. The clock is not working, so I have a handheld one that I'm running. Okay. Just Do you make a beeping noise when it's over? It, or? Uh, it did. I, I don't know if you heard it or not. <laughs> But it Whatever makes you want to do to notify us when it's time, that'll be fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. It just went out. So. Michelle Kinman. Good, Good afternoon, rather. I'm Michelle Kinman, the Clean Energy and Transportation Program Director for Environment California. And I'd like to sincerely thank you all for looking into this important air quality issue and identifying solutions for freeway-adjacent communities. 
I drove here today in my Chevy Bolt, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, but unfortunately on today's drive, I wasn't part of the solution. And that's because I'm one of the nearly 50% of Californians who live in a multifamily dwelling unit, and I don't have access to charge my car, and so unfortunately I had to gas it up. Requiring a percentage of parking spaces at new developments to include EV charging, or at least be EV ready, by running electrical capabilities during construction is a key part of getting our city ready for the influx of electric vehicles that we need to address our air quality problems. San Francisco, Atlanta, Oakland, and a number of other cities have all passed strong EV charging ordinances. I know that LA can and must, with our public health and climate imperatives, lead the way on this initiative, and therefore we fully support the recommendation in the report to pursue the EV charging requirement, and only ask that the percentages be a floor and not a ceiling in your study. Thank you. Thank you. Jorge Madrid, Jill Johnston. Good afternoon, my name is Jorge Madrid. I'm the California Clean Energy Manager at the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, but today I'm speaking as a Boyle Heights resident. Uh, I live right smack in the middle of the East LA interchange, the busiest freeway interchange in the world. Um, I have a six month old son who spent a week in the hospital with a respiratory infection. Um, this is serious and this is very personal to me. I want to echo the comments of a lot of the folks that came here earlier, especially the expansion of zero emission vehicles, particularly medium and light, uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles, which we know are the largest contributors to gases and pollution. Uh, but secondly, I want to say that we need to do triage and we need to do it now. Um, I, I understand that there still needs to be more research on uh, vegetation and other kinds of barriers around freeways. I would also add freeway overpasses where a lot of school children walk to school. Um, if there was any ever a time and a place for a pilot and a study to understand how to do that, uh, Boyle Heights, my neighborhood, is a prime candidate. So thank you, and uh, I urge you. Oops. Thank you. I think I broke your microphone. Thank you. Have you ever noticed that in uh, Caltrans and the freeways, the vegetation in low-income areas is a lot less, and the public ways there are not taken care of or maintained as much as other areas. I've never understood that. It's just, yeah. we just give up in low-income areas. They're also full of trash, too. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. It's the same freeway, says Mr. Harris Dawson, but yet other areas better maintained. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jill Johnston. I'm assistant professor at USC Keck School of Medicine. And I just want to come here and review a little bit of 25 years of research that we've learned about when studying the impacts of near roadway air pollution. You know, so very quickly we know it increases your risk for asthma. It causes um, smaller lungs for life, which really puts you at risk for uh, numerous chronic diseases. It can increase your risk for both obesity and type 2 diabetes. And sort of emerging research is really looking at the impact on the elderly and how it's related to cognitive decline and increase in um, risk for Alzheimer's. We know when understanding the, the exposures that it's this 1,000 foot buffer where we see the highest levels of this mixture of pollution that's related to near roadways. And so when we think about what we can do to reduce people's exposure, what the science is showing is that, you know, reducing emissions, reducing sources is most important and thinking about these zero emissions technologies. Increasing the space from where people live in the freeways is important. Um, and yeah, and also understanding impacts on these cumulative burden populations. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Again, somebody named Reflo here. It's probably Herman signing up like that. Okay, thank you. That concludes our public comment. And uh, I want to thank the um, planning department for their work on this. Uh, certainly air pollution, as was noted, is uh, an urgent and complex matter to deal with, particularly here in Los Angeles. I, too, live in Boa Heights, as one of the speakers uh, mentioned. And we have five major freeways cutting through the neighborhood and I actually do live within 500 feet of, um, of a freeway. Uh, and so I recognize, as the report recognizes, the need to balance the need for more housing with the health impacts of living near a freeway. And the report rightly proposes a two-prong approach, which is one, reduce exposure to pollution, and two, reduce pollution itself. Uh, that's the correct approach. Um, however, uh, the report itself, I think, needed some improvements on specifics, 
and actionable recommendations that we can take today. I think there's a lot um, to be wanting in terms of having actual recommendations before the committee so that we could move forward with this. Um, I do have some, re some questions on the, uh, or follow-ups on the um, report. Um, first is on filtration. Um, do we routinely inspect filtration systems now, either HCID or building and safety? So we spoke with our colleagues at Housing Department. Um, they don't re make it a part of their routine, but they are looking to work with their inspectors um, to be able to inspect the filters that are in common areas. They would not have the ability to enter an individual residential unit to inspect, but they can work with perhaps the property manager or others on the building site to help educate the residents as to why it would be valuable and important for their health to more routinely change out those filters. Um, is that an HCID responsibility or a building and safety responsibility? So with the on um, multifamily residential projects, that would be HCID as part of their SCEP program. They do routinely said, inspect buildings um, every couple of years. Um, so they would do it with, when we talk with building and safety about non-residential, but again, they are the ones right now who are ensuring that buildings are complying the new projects are complying with the KUGU standard. So again, there is a requirement that within a thousand feet that non-residential and residential projects who include a mechanical air system have to include those filters. But there is no inspection program that building and safety goes out on a regular basis. They basically are about, you know, you pull the building permit and once that okay. gets a CFO, we don't have an inspection program. Okay, so we, we do have a fire alarm program, right? When we, those the fire alarms get inspected by the fire department or we require the property manager to inspect them every certain times, but there's no such system for air fil filtration, okay. That's correct. And, and we are now requiring L fil filters uh, in HVAC systems in new buildings, um, but in existing buildings, um, do we or can we require higher, higher levels of of filtration systems? So, so we had a conversation with building and safety about about that very question. So I think the challenge is that, first of all, there are a lot of, you know, older buildings don't really use mechanical, you know, air conditioning systems. They might do some mechanical heating. Um, they may not have a central system, but that oftentimes these older systems might not be suited to putting the, the more um, dense filter on. They may not have the ability to kind of power through those more dense filters. Yeah, it's not, it's not a simple just go ahead and retrofit and put a heavier filter on an older system. They just would not have the ability to, you have, they need a lot more power, obviously, to be able to still let the filter, the air go through what is now a much more dense filter. Okay. And uh, the report calls for a use package to be developed through Recode, um, which is, I think, there are several ways we could go about this. We could come up with certain legislative recommendations before. So really what separate from Recode, but when, do, when is Recode going to be available or finished or so the whole process? Re the reason we think Recode is really the right way to look at this is that we think this, it's really, by having the, a, a use package in Recode, kind of similar to the way we have, use pack, we have uses today that don't allow residential, like an industrial or a commercial package, that as community plans are updated, and those are happening now that are actually tapping into the new Recode, then you have the communities are able to kind of look to their specific situation and best identify the range of uses that would be appropriate to, to that particular location. So the recode is being worked on now and the community plans such as in Boyle Heights and downtown are gonna be able to avail themselves of those new packages. So it's an opportunity actually to be to helping identify what would be the appropriate use packages when we're doing the community plans kind of concurrent with the, the dialogue with recode. Okay. And on the design guidelines uh, that are proposed in item number five, um, do we know what specific changes we need to make there or what, how do we need so to come we, up with that? We, right, we don't have currently healthy building design guidelines. It was established or is identified in the Plan for Healthy Los Angeles as a, as a, as a program to look at. We are actually hoping to obtain an intern this summer who's gonna help us work on those. The consultant who did 
developed the plan for Healthy Los Angeles, um, actually developed an outline of what might be considered. So one of the things we might look at is indoor air quality. And somebody mentioned monitoring and actually being able, there's uh, the Well Institute has actually established a protocol where you actually, uh, units are actually able to monitor the indoor air quality in, a, in their unit. Because um, we also know that indoor air pollution can be quite high from paint and other kinds of furniture. And so maybe you are living in a unit near a freeway, but you have a monitor so that there could be a day like today when the air is actually relatively cold. And so the air quality is actually probably quite good outside your window. And so you might open up your window and find that you're by that, getting that air movement through your unit, you're actually provide, you know, creating a, a healthier environment for you. Where on a hot day, you, the air quality outside might be poor relative to your indoor air quality. And so you might keep your window shut. So that kind of a guideline like that that helped those yeah. things like that. So, and, and it's great that we're pointing out that uh, we need to build out our electric vehicle infrastructure, um, but to move that forward, do we need an additional separate ordinance or do we, how, how can we move the ball so on the, that? If we know that's a, a solution to, you know, the pollution we see, how, how do we move that? Yes, yeah, so that's a really good needle. question. So we actually had another conversation with building and safety about that because actually right now in the building and safety code, um, the city already does have a requirement that de new developments have to provide a percentage that's around three to five to six percent, depending on the use type, to be EV ready. Um, they do require a small percentage of residential um, properties or a percentage of residential properties to also include a small percentage of actual installed. The State has a requirement of 3%, so we basically have almost doubled that, but it would be with building and safety. We would work with them to create a much more stringent requirement that we have today. They might recommend that um, Title 24 is going to be updated in 2020 and at the state level, and it's an opportunity for the city to work with the state to help push the state to a more aggressive level as well. It's just another opportunity. But we also could start working with building and safety now, if should that be the direction from your committee to direct the um, to planning to work with building and safety to try to develop a standard that would be greater than we have now. Uh, we'd be very interested in that. Okay. Um, and finally, on uh, is there any way of getting real-time information from air quality monitors, or do we get that now from some of the buildings that are out there? Or We, we don't seem to get real-time information from the air quality monitors. Yeah, I'll just speak kind of anecdotally. When we were meeting with the air quality experts, I have to say, and perhaps some of them can speak, speak greater to that, I was a bit surprised at the lack of existing monitoring systems um, other than kind of capturing a few general uh, requirements. That we don't have as many just out in the field as one might expect to kind of understand um, air currents and other uh, particular circumstances with development. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. harris -Dawson? I have a quick question, uh, not related to the land use um, issues, but the clean energy vehicles. So it seems to me that the, the challenge with the clean energy vehicles is actually people's ability to get them. Uh, like, so now the waiting list is, it takes a while to get one. Uh, so I'm just curious, do we have any sense of what the uses of existing um, chargers are and do you mean the the extent to which the EV chargers we've put out in public right away right, are being so, used so right so we have them at DWP buildings it seems like it would be easy enough to know are half of them being used are they used all the time they can find out or at least you know we certainly can find out again speaking anecdotally as someone who has an electric vehicle I will say that the demand seems to um, uh, outpace the current supply um, and projects are currently kind of catching up with the requirement from a couple years ago as they start to get uh, developed or uh, constructed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Price. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your, uh, for your leadership on this and thank you for the report. I know that uh, <clears throat> quite a bit of thought has gone into it and I appreciate the uh, comments made by uh, my just staff and public on this this issue, thoughtful, uh, thoughtful comments. Uh, I've got some, uh, some questions and, and some strong concerns uh, regarding this report, though, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, my, my district is crisscrossed by the 10 uh, and, and the 110, and I'm, I'm specifically concerned uh, for smaller projects uh, within that, 
thousand feet. Uh, you know, we're making making it uh, creating additional burdens, additional regulations for smaller type projects. Uh, and I guess more specifically, how do we how do we decide to look at properties within a thousand feet, uh, especially when the California Resources Board uses a hundred or five hundred foot buffer? So how do we come to a thousand as opposed to? And again, I, I appreciate the balance that we're trying to achieve, uh, but, but, but the, I think the that uh, with other mitigation measures in place, uh, just curious how we could uh, again support smaller projects. Right. So right now, the only requirement within for any project within that thousand feet is is the filter requirement. So again, new projects Pardon? as well as. Sorry, what would you say? I said the only requirement for any new project within that thousand feet is the filter requirement. So there is no other requirement that's imposed on a project within the thousand feet of a freeway today, other I than. I know, but I'm saying, yeah. so why does it have to be a thousand? Why can't it be 500? That's what I'm saying. How do we come to the? Right. So that thousand feet was actually established by um, by by zoning code by. Actually, in the, actually, it's actually in the building code. This was a, something that was adopted by council. I know that our city planning commission felt strongly about the thousand feet. I believe the Center for Disease Control, even in their report, um, spoke about the 500. But then there's also been a ref, uh, understanding that again, the further you can get people to the thousand feet is not a bad thing either. So the 500 though is, I mean, the thousand is you say is in. Is in it's even, our ordinance now. It's in it's, it's the thousand, policy. Right, the the thousand feet was established as part of the cleanup green up ordinance, and that was adopted by the city council. Shauna Bonson. The only thing that I would add is, while it is true on the books we have a thousand feet for the MERV uh, filtration, I think you speak to kind of a point that we have struggled with, which is one, there isn't an industry standard on uh, the distancing, but also particularly when you talk about kind of barriers and other design components, so much is dependent on kind of case by case and site uh, scenarios, including uh, topography, uh, prevailing winds, and so on, that it's very hard to establish kind of a one size fits all requirement. I agree. I just thought it, it should be a smaller size. <laughs> I wonder Thank if it would. This is Kevin Keller, City Planning. Um, I think, again, we wanted to give you an update on the, the requirements we have on the books today. We do have, I think, as Claire mentioned, we have one requirement on the books today for 1,000 feet. And I believe you know, that is one of the numbers tossed around. But I think, as you're pointing out, this is a balancing action. Our report also talked about the need for, and I think some of the speakers talked about, providing housing capacity and new housing, but also limiting housing near freeways. These are all part of the planning process. Same thing in terms of the cost to new developers, small businesses, economic development. Um, all of this needs to be balanced, but we are trying to strike that balance. So for today's report, we wanted to highlight that we have an existing regulation at 1,000 feet. As I think as we continue to dialogue and maybe report back to the committee, I think we want to take into consideration that that is not set in stone and other regulations could be smaller or as I think right. some people mentioned, even larger. Yeah, I, I like a more complete consideration of what those alternatives would be if it, if it were reduced. Right. I think it's just also important to just reiterate that while there has been a lot of focus on the freeways, the, and, and as the report today in the paper pointed out, that air quality is bad throughout Southern California. Um, I mean, there are some particles that are worse near freeways, but there are some particles that are uniformly poor throughout throughout the region, and that looking at, again, at the solutions is looking at very comprehensive solutions that help reduce the mobile source emissions overall, which would increase the quality of everybody. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to continue this item to allow the planning department to develop more specific recommendations um, from the report uh, per today's discussion. <clears throat> um, and it's hopefully we could bring this back uh, before the summer recess so we could have uh, some additional recommendations on getting some more concrete ways of moving forward. So my staff will be in touch with the planning department and other parties to uh, to um, come up with more specific recommendations if any other staff would, or any other council member staff would like to join as well, please do. Thank you, so we'll continue this item without objection. Any other items? Uh, no other items, Councilman. Okay, I think we have public comment, right? Uh, yes. Okay, public comment. Zach Strasters. Anybody here on public comment? There are two more. Okay. There's two gentlemen back there as well. 
So, good afternoon. My name is Zach Strosters. I'm here on behalf of the ARMS organization. It's nice to see you guys up close. I see you all the time in the big room, so it's cool getting a little up close. Okay. I'm talking on behalf of the 2,500-foot oil and gas drilling setback. And so, uh, the ARMS organization is opposed to it because of the overall impact that's going to be made to economy. 360,000 plus jobs in greater California will be affected by a 2,500-foot setback. Furthermore, in Los Angeles County alone, we're talking about 100,000 plus jobs. The precedent that would be set by a 2,500-foot oil and gas drilling setback would mean an incredible uh, uh, cost to the family in Southern California, in particular Los Angeles, where there are great disparities in income. We're already moving into one of the most expensive summers in terms of the cost at the pump, and uh, a move like this has a huge ramification for the family. And so, uh, it, at the risk of offending a room full of environmentalists, I'd like to say we also need to consider the cost for the family in Southern California and LA in particular. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Before we go on, I just want to note for the record that I believe Mr. Herman polluted our public comment speaker cards by putting a number of um, false names here, such as Miss Lovejoy and other names. So just for the record that he continues to disrupt this meeting and, and continues to commit fraud by signing up with false names. Thank you. Robert Polito and Mark Kinnerson. Sure. Mark Harrison, Rob Polito, Noel Weiss. Noel Weiss, go right ahead. Thank you, thank you, Council Member. Um, in terms of uh, general public comment here, I think. Um, there is a broader concern. I mean, in terms of my, my desire on behalf of the tenants really relates to the loss of the middle class. That was the situation 10 years ago or 11 years ago now, April 2007, when Janice Hahn and Mr. Wiesar were part of the effort to try to get the relocation fees raised, kind of uh, to uh, uh, slim those rough edges. Uh, and uh, going forward, I'm beginning to have a concern, apparently, with this idea of overburdened properties where there's not enforcement by housing, where there's not enforcement by uh, the, the Department of Building and Safety, and where you've got maybe 10 to 15 people in units of duplexes, single-family homes. Now, maybe we don't want to recognize that problem, but I think we need to, and there has to be, I would love to work with the members of the committee, maybe Mr. Cedillo on housing, but we have to, if there's truly affordable housing crisis, we got to find ways of delivering really true affordable housing at a, at a decent cost. And I'm hoping that maybe there can be some reciprocity in terms of coming my way here and, and listening to some ideas and maybe uh, at least generating some food for thought. Thank you. Mark Kennerson, Rob Polito. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Robert Polito. I represent the ARMS organization. Um, if our local government decides to approve a 2,500-foot setback, there are going to be serious consequences for my family. Mm. People like myself who live in Southern California are already feeling the effect of the highest gas prices in the country at the, ga at the gas pump. The very uh, real effects of their decisions will have, will have on their constituents and their families' ability to maintain a decent standard of living. If we eliminate the 100,000 uh, plus jobs from Los Angeles County, stab local fuel production in the neck, and ask environmentally insensitive countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia to satisfy our oil and gas needs, um, are we doing LA, our LA families any favors? What about our economy, the environment? Who exactly is supposed to benefit from this shutdown? Please vote no on the 2,500 foot oil and gas setback. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Mark Kennerson. And I, too, am with the uh, ARMS organization. And California's oil and gas industry provides over 360,000 well-paying middle-class jobs. And these aren't just your run-of-the-mill temp agency fly-by-night under-the-table gigs that so many of the us Angelinos have been corralled into over the past 20 years. These are stable, reliable, family-supporting careers. These are the types of jobs that were, were the bedrock of our nation's economy in its golden era. And now, with the setback, we're talking about eliminating them. The message that we'd be sending to the neighborhoods and communities of L.A. is that good-paying jobs aren't trendy enough to drive policymaking and the needs of the family are secondary to fashionable politics.
If not for the family, if not for the protection of our local economy, then who and what exactly are we paying our elected officials to represent? Please consider the impact of our decision here today and vote no, as, my, as me and my colleagues are, in agreement with the 2,500-foot oil and gas setback. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Any other uh, items on the agenda? Uh, no, Council. Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.